This is number one in a series of 12 lectures on the subject of prophecy. In 1975, it was my privilege to spend a great part of the summer traveling and studying in the Middle East. And uh, we traveled to many countries, and of course, the most exciting place to be uh, when one studies prophecy or when one desires to look into the things of God, geographically speaking, is the land of Palestine. And I remember on one occasion standing outside the walled city of Jerusalem at the gate called Jaffa. And uh, a little Volkswagen bus went by, and there was a sign on the back of this bus that read, Guess Who's Coming to Palestine Soon? And the Volkswagen sped off. And a group of Jewish citizens were standing on the corner waiting for a bus to come by, and they saw the same sign that I saw in one turn to another and said, and I quote, Is Henry coming again so soon? Referring, of course, to the Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger. Well, I walked over and introduced myself, and we entered into a conversation, and I said, You know, I couldn't help but hear what you said. I have an idea that that sign might have referred to another person. Oh, said one Jewish citizen, <clears throat> who do you have in mind? Who do you think they had in mind? And I said, that person that may be coming to Palestine soon might have been, what they had in mind might have been, the Jewish Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. As we said before, I cannot think of a more exciting and yet, in a sense, a more misunderstood subject in all the Word of God than the subject of prophecy. And we're going to approach this thrilling subject in the next 11 lectures along the following lines. We'll be looking into the rapture of the church. Someone has described this as the greatest space shot of all time. And then the judgment seat of Christ. This is also going to be described as that court in outer space. And then the marriage of the Lamb, the greatest and grandest and most glorious of all weddings, is yet to take place. And then a very mysterious seven-seal book. A lot of uh, prophecy books overlook this subject, but Revelation 4 and 5 deserves careful interpretation and uh, careful examination. So we'll be getting into this in our prophetical studies, a seven-sealed book. And then, as someone has described the next period, seven years of hell, or the tribulation, the time of Jacob's trouble. And then the greatest moment in all human history, the second coming of Christ. And we'll examine the millennium. And then the final revolt of Satan. And then the great white judgment throne the destruction of the present earth and heavens, and finally, the new creation of heaven and earth. So it really proves to be a great time, and, and we're glad that you've determined to take this course, that you've signed up for the Liberty Home Bible Institute. The first word that I <clears throat> would like for us to examine, the first phase of prophecy, has been referred to by many Bible believers as the word uh, in the by the word rapture, R A P T U R E. Some time ago, I had a person who was not in the conservative field of theology, could not be regarded as a conservative or a fundamentalist, and uh, he sort of blew up and he said, "You know," he said, "you you Bible bangers bother me." He said, you're always going around spouting Bible verses, but he said, sometimes, he said, in your zeal, he said, you don't even refer to the Bible. That is to say, you, uh, you invent terms. I said, what do you have in mind? He said, well, he said, you talk about the rapture, and entire books are written on the rapture, and preachers preach messages on the rapture. He said, that word is not even found in the Bible, is it? And I said, well... It's true. The word rapture <coughs> is not found mentioned <coughs> in the King James Bible. But I said, neither is the word Bible found in the Word of God, and neither is the word <coughs> grandfather found in the Bible, neither is the word demon or trinity found in the King James translation of the Word of God. But there is <coughs> a trinity, there is a Bible, there certainly are grandfathers mentioned, referred to, 
And um, so even though the word itself is not a scriptural word, it is certainly not an unscriptural word. It is simply a non-scriptural word. And the word <clears throat> is a Latin word, and it means to transport from one place to another, to move from one location to that of another location. By way of illustration, let us suppose <clears throat> that you had in your hand a box containing some small silver nails and perhaps a number of small wooden slivers. And you would like to separate out of this box the nails from the wooden slivers. Now, you could reach in one at a time in this matchbox-like affair, I suppose, and make two piles on a desk, one the pile of nails and the other the pile of the wooden slivers, but that might take you a while. You know a fast way to separate the tiny silver nails from the wooden slivers would be to pour out the entire contents of the box upon a table and sort of, uh, you know, uh, scoot them out with your hand and then take a horseshoe magnet and make a slow pass over that pile of wooden slivers and metal nails. <clears throat> and of course we all know what would happen. The nails would be caught up to meet the magnet in the air. Now this is a crude but I believe an effective example, an illustration of the rapture. Someday when the Savior comes, He's not going to come for Baptists or Catholics or black people or white people or church members or non-church members or Americans or Russians or educated or non-educated men or women. <clears throat> He's going to come for those individuals that have the same nature as he himself has. And these individuals, these men and women and boys and girls are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air as those nails would be caught up to meet the magnet in the air. You see, one of the thrilling things that happens when a man accepts Christ as Savior, the Bible says that he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new. There are many passages that describe the rapture. The two most important is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let me read that these two passages at this time. Paul writes both of them, <clears throat> and he says in 1 Thessalonians 4, here I'm reading from the New American Standard version of the Bible, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not precede those that have fallen asleep, for the Lord himself <clears throat> shall descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel, with the shout, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. <clears throat> then the other passage is found in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, <clears throat> and this mortal must put on <clears throat> immortality. Now that's the meaning of the word rapture and some of the key passages. All right, now, the next point, the participants of the rapture. For whom will Jesus come? We've already, in a sense, discussed this, and it is the view of this theological summary of prophecy that Christ will come again for his church, not the Baptist or the Catholic or the Presbyterian, but for his church, which is composed of all saved people from Pentecost up to the rapture itself. And so, therefore, there seems to be <clears throat> four types of, participa uh, of uh, people who are participate in this rapture. Number one will be the Lord Jesus himself. See, the Bible says the Lord himself. He's not going to send a heavenly Henry Kissinger. He's coming himself. And secondly, with the trump of God, the archangel, 
and this could be the Archangel Michael. There are two special angels mentioned in the Bible by name. One is Gabriel and the other is Michael. And uh, in Daniel chapter 10 and then Jan Daniel 12 and also Jude chapter 1 verse 9 in Revelation 12, it seems to indicate that this archangel that will po possibly even blow the trumpet at the rapture will be Michael. So it would be the Lord Jesus, be the archangel, <clears throat> and then the bodies of dead believers will participate in the rapture. The Bible says this corruptible must put on incorruption, and that refers to the bodies of departed believers. Then the fourth <clears throat> group that will participate, the translated bodies of living believers. Because in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, and this mortal referring to mortal bodies that are saved down here, must put on immortality. Now, let's examine for a few moments the false views of the rapture. There are several that I'd like to call to your attention to, at least four. Number one <clears throat> is this, that the rapture is the same as the second coming of Christ. Now, we attempt to distinguish in our Bible uh, sessions here between the rapture and the second coming. May I make a statement that perhaps will shock some of you, but I trust that I'll be able to clarify it. And here's the statement. Now, I know we talk about the second coming. We sing about the second coming. We preach about the second coming. Dear friend, I hope I never see the second coming. I'm not looking forward to the second coming to see it at all, because I want to be in it. You see, as I understand the Bible, the rapture takes place when our Lord comes for his people. The second coming takes place when Jesus comes with his people. And he cannot come with his people until he comes for his people. When will the rapture take place? No one knows. No one has any idea. But as I understand, again, the scripture correctly, the rapture or the second coming could not possibly take place until at least 1983 because this is 1976 when this tape is made and the duration of time between the rapture and the second coming will be a period of seven years. And at the end of the tribulation at the battle of Armageddon, the second coming will take place when our Lord Jesus will come with 10,000 of his saints to defeat the devil at the battle of Armageddon. And so the second coming could not possibly take place until at least 1970 or 83, and that could only take place if our Lord came this year. But when the rapture will take place, no one knows. And so the first false view, I believe, is that the rapture <clears throat> is the same as the second coming. We think that's false. Secondly, this is a very prevalent view today, the second one, that the rapture will include only spiritual Christians. That is to say, when Jesus comes, he'll only come for those Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, tithing, witnessing, visiting, praying Christians. And then the rest of the sorry rascals that claim the name of Christ will be left behind to endure a Protestant purgatory of seven years. Now, you know, maybe that's the way God should do it. But that's not the way he's going to do it. Because there's one little verse that completely refutes the partial rapture theory. And that verse is First Thessalonians, I'm sorry, First Corinthians chapter fifteen and verse fifty one, where Paul says, We shall not all sleep, we will not all be dead when Jesus comes, but we shall all we shall all, A-L-L, -L, be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. <clears throat> now, Paul wrote this chapter, and he wrote this book, perhaps the most confused and corrupted and carnal church in the entire New Testament, with the exception of the church of Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3. He writes this to the church at Corinth. You name a subject, <clears throat> they were mixed up on it. They were mixed up on the rapture. They were mixed up on the judgment seat of Christ. They were confused about the resurrection. They didn't know a lot about the Lord's table. They were arguing constantly, bickering. The church was threatened to split over the matters of baptism. Oh, what a backslidden group of 
believers that they were. And yet Paul says when the rapture takes place, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all, even those backslidden believers in the city of Corinth, shall be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, <clears throat> there is another theory of the rapture that I do not believe is the scriptural one. That says that the rapture will not occur until the middle of the tribulation. And this says that all the church, even the spiritual Christians, will have to go through at least the first three and a half years of the tribulation, and that during the middle of the tribulation, then God will catch up his true church. Well, <clears throat> This is refuted, I believe, on the grounds of 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, where Paul says, God hath not appointed us to wrath. I'll come back and comment on that in a minute because this ties in with the fourth false theory. Then the fourth false theory says this, that the rapture will occur, will not occur until the very end of the tribulation. This is known as the post-tribulational position. You see, uh, the third view is called the mid-tribulational position, and that says that the church will have to go through part of the tribulation and then be caught up. The post-tribulationist says, no, the church will have to go through the entire seven years before God catches the church up. Now, there are a number of passages, some we've already read, others we could quote that would prove I think beyond any shadow of a doubt to the sincere Bible reader that the pre-tribulational, pre-millennial return of Christ is the scriptural one. You see, the New Testament pictures the church as the body and as the bride of Christ. And if the mid-tribulation or the post-tribulation view is correct, then a part of this body would suffer amputation and a section of the bride would be left behind. In addition to this, one would be forced to conclude that all bodies of carnal departed Christians would likewise be left in the grave, and this is simply not the clear teaching of the Word of God. I think uh, one of the strongest proofs of this statement, that is to say that uh, it will include all believers, is as we turn the book of Revelation, we uh, read the fact that up to chapter 5, the church is, I'm sorry, up to chapter 4, the church is mentioned some, oh, I think uh, 32 times, I believe, and after that, the church is not mentioned until one comes to Revelation chapter 19, and then the church is seen presented in holy marriage to God. So, the church does not appear is not mentioned during the tribulation, and there are two conclusions that one might come to. You don't find any mention of it. Number one, that the church has disappeared. That is to say that it's failed, it's gone out of business, and the reason that you don't find it mentioned in the tribulation is because it simply ceases to exist like the Philistines have ceased to exist. Well, if that's the case, then we are in a peck of trouble because this would make Jesus a liar. In Matthew chapter 16, he promised that he would establish his church and that the gates of hell would not prevail against it. The other conclusion that one might draw is that the church is not mentioned because the church is not present. It has been removed. And, of course, this is the scriptural position. In fact, during the tribulation, the only godly group that Satan can find to persecute is the nation Israel. Now, let me just <clears throat> call your attention to something else. I don't know if you remember or not, and this will be directed to only those ancient people that are listening to me that are as old as I am. I'm 44 years of age. I uh, should have been 45. I was sick a year. <laughs> but I... Uh, I often ask this when I preach on prophecy. How many remember, as I do, what you were doing on December the 7th, 1941, on a Sunday afternoon? Let me see a show of hands. <laughs> oh, yes, I see many hands out there. Listen, I remember what I was doing on that Sunday. It was a bright, sunny afternoon in Mount Vernon, Illinois, and I had been to a little 
Methodist church. My parents did not attend church very often in those days, and my brother and I went to church, and we came home, and we stopped and, and talked to a friend of mine, and, and we came in, and Mom and Dad had the radio on, and it was just blaring out some fearful news. And, and uh, I remember Mother crying, and my dad sort of bent over the radio, and all the color drained from his face, and, and I thought something terrible had happened, and I thought first maybe one of my little sisters had died. And I said, Dad, what's wrong? And then he told me. He said, Son, he said, the Japanese have just bombed Pearl Harbor. And he said, This probably means that we're in for a very bloody war. And sure enough, the next few days, I remember the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, making that well-known speech, This is a day that will go down in infamy. And then he went to the Congress of the United States and requested that the Congress declare a state of war between the United States of America and Tokyo, Japan, and Berlin, Germany, and uh, the various nations that we were fighting at that time, Rome, Italy. And the next day after that, when we declared war on those three nations, President Roosevelt sent a message to the American ambassador in the three enemy capitals, and the message read the same, Pack your bags and come home. Why? Because a war now exists between that country and our country. And you see, the last thing, the final thing that a king or a president of a nation usually does before he declares war on another president or another country, he calls his ambassadors home. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, Paul says that we are, as believers, the, and you've guessed it, ambassadors of Christ. Someday God is going to declare an all-out war upon this earth. It's a seven-year war. It's called the Great Tribulation. But before he calls down judgment and declares that war, he's going to call his ambassadors home. All right, now. What is the purpose of the rapture? We've looked at the meaning of the rapture, the participants in the rapture, the false views of the rapture, the purpose of the rapture. We'll discuss these a little later, but at least two key things that I can see, uh, the purpose of the rapture. Number one, to judge and reward the church of God. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, and as I say, we'll discuss this in greater length in another lecture, for we, Paul said, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, whether it be good or bad. And so one of the reasons is to judge and reward the church of God. And he can't do that until he takes it from this earth. So that's one of the purposes of the rapture. And then another very important per uh, purpose of the rapture is to remove the Spirit of God, at least from uh, hindering evil as he does today. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7, the Apostle Paul writes the following words, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains, and many believe this to be a reference to the Holy Spirit, the he here, will do so until he is taken out of the way. End of quotes. Now, many theologians, as I said, believe that the he in this verse is a reference to the Holy Spirit. So, thus the Holy Spirit of God has been acting as a divine dam, holding back the waters of sin. And the only reason, dear Christian friend, that the devil didn't kill you five minutes ago, he's wanted to. The Bible said on one occasion, Jesus turned to Simon Peter and said, Satan hath desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for thee. The only reason is because of the faithful ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. He restrains evil. And God knows there's enough evil on earth today, but it were not for the Holy Spirit, the Antichrist would have taken over five minutes ago, you see. So one of the reasons for the rapture is to remove the Spirit of God in order to let the devil have full sway upon this earth for seven years. And at the rapture, this blessed influence as exerted by the Holy Spirit, will be removed to a large extent. 
in order to prepare the way for the tribulation. All right, now, the next point in our textbook is the mystery of the rapture. What is the mystery? Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, he says, Behold, I show you a mystery. Some time ago, I had a church in a northern city. Some uh, wag, and trickster, had uh, placed the words, printed out the words of 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, across the door leading into the nursery. And that passage, of course, says, We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, let me just say, that's what you call lubricating the Scripture. That's not what this verse teaches at all. But Paul does say, I show you a mystery. There are a number of mysteries in the Bible. A mystery is not some deep, dark, secret like the theory of relativity as invented by Albert Einstein that only a Ph.D. can understand, but a mystery is a very simple thing, perhaps, but it has been hidden uh, from the previous ages and then revealed during a certain age. And there is a mystery of godliness and the mystery of uh, lawlessness and the mystery of Israel's blindness. And some of the mysteries are still not explained to us in the Bible, and others are. But the mystery of the rapture <clears throat> is a very simple mystery, and it is explained here in 1 Corinthians 15. Let me just say this. Let us suppose that here is a pastor who has a chance to lead a person to Christ last year. And a year later, he happens to see this person again. Perhaps they're on the same airplane, and they happen to meet. And uh, so they discuss uh, the circumstances surrounding their last meeting. And the pastor might say, all right, have you been reading the Bible since I saw you last? Oh, yes, pastor, I certainly have. I began reading that Bible that you gave me, and well, I'm practically through it now. I've read the Old Testament, and I've read... Uh, Matthew and Mark and Luke and John and Acts and the book of Romans. And, and in fact, I, I was reading it right now as you came and sat down beside me on this plane. And I'm up to 1 Corinthians 14. And I'm going to plan to read the entire New Testament through in the next few weeks because I love it. And the pastor might say, that's great. I, I just love to see a new believer in the Word. Tell you what, I'm going to ask you a few questions and just learn how much you found out about the Bible. Well, if the pastor asked the new believer to tell him what he'd learned about the Bible, the new believer could tell him a lot of things, couldn't he? If he read up through 1 Corinthians 14, he could tell him about creation, what God did the first day and the second day and the third day. He could tell him about, tell him about man's sin, how man turned his back upon God. He could talk about the flood of Noah. And, uh, oh, he could talk about the miracles in the Old Testament, the crossing of the Red Sea and and Samson defeating the Philistines. And then he could talk about the New Testament, about Bethlehem, and about Calvary, and the resurrection, the ascension. He could tell him about Pentecost. And let's suppose the pastor said, that's just great. You've really learned a lot about it. But now the most important thing, of course, is about heaven. Tell me, what have you learned about heaven? What do you have to do? What does a man have to do to get to heaven? Now, if this new convert had stopped his reading at 1 Corinthians 14. You know what he would tell the pastor? And he'd be right. He'd say, okay, pastor, you've asked me what you have to do to get to heaven. You have to do two things. Number one, you have to be born again. And number two, you have to die. And he'd be right. Of course, he'd certainly be right any time when he said you have to be born again. But if he stopped his reading at 1 Corinthians 14, he would conclude, and rightfully so, that in order for a believer to get to heaven, he'd have to die. Oh, there were two exceptions to that, of course, Enoch and Elijah, but these were only the exceptions. And everybody, even like David, a man after God's own heart, had to die in order to get to heaven. But now in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I'm going to show you something God has shown me, a brand new truth that has never been revealed before. And here is the mystery. Here the secret is out. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That literally means die. But we shall all be changed. Paul is saying this, that all believers 
who are living when Christ comes again will get to heaven without dying. And that's the mystery of the rapture. There's a song that I love to sing, at least hear sung. It's called Christ Returneth. And the last stanza speaks about this. It says, O oh joy, O oh delight, should we go without dying? No sickness, no sadness, no dread, and no crying. Caught up in the clouds with our Lord into glory when Jesus receives his own. That's the mystery of the rapture. Now a word or so concerning the trumpet of the rapture. In at least three biblical passages concerning the rapture, a trumpet is mentioned. These passages are 1 Corinthians 15, 52. It speaks of the last trump. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. The uh, angel shall sound the trump. And then in Revelation chapter 4, John says, I heard a voice as it were of a trumpet. And we like to sing about that trumpet, of course, even today. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound, and time shall be no more. What about this trumpet with, uh, concerning the rapture? Let me say this, that in the Bible class, the most important musical instrument is not a harp. It may be one of the most beautiful. The most important musical instrument is the trumpet. And... Uh, these passages in the New Testament were read, doubtless, by those believers, many of them of the Jewish faith, that were well acquainted with the Old Testament. And when they read about this trumpet, their minds would doubtless have gone back to a passage in the Old Testament where a trumpet is mentioned. In fact, two trumpets are mentioned. That would be in Numbers chapter 10. And... Of course, when this chapter took place, the events in this chapter, the children of Israel were in a very hostile desert. They were, had left the land of Egypt, and they were on their way toward Palestine. And God told Moses to make, construct a silver trumpet and learn to blow that trumpet so that two sounds would come out of it, and that would have a twofold meaning. And one sound would be prepare to worship. In other words, maybe God desired to call a special chapel that morning, and uh, so he would sound, uh, Moses would learn, or the trumpet player would learn to sound uh, the trumpet in such a way as to give forth that message, prepare to worship. But there was another message connected with the trumpet. Perhaps during the night, a fierce enemy of Israel had sneaked up and had uh, surrounded them and were ready to attack. And as soon as the guards would find out about this, they would blow the trumpet alarm. And then the message would be, not prepare to worship, but prepare to fight. And so you, uh, you sort of had to listen to find out whether you should grab your Bible or your sword, you see. And I'm sure this must have happened in a number of the tents. Here is a family... And, uh, of course, uh, if the truth were known, they're sacked out at 6.30 in the morning. They're still sleeping. and should have been up. But if the truth were known, they were uh, up watching the Jewish Johnny Carson show a little too late that night in the desert. Uh, that's Wilmington's a perversion of the Bible here, by the way. And so they're all sacked out, and suddenly the trumpet begins to blow. Well, Levi jumps up. And he steps on the dog, and uh, the dog begins to whine and bark and wakes up the baby, and the baby begins to scream, and the kids begin to cry, and Mom gets up, and she's pretty well uh, put out. And Levi, what in the world are you doing at 6.30 in the morning? Don't you know we need to sleep in a little this morning? And, and uh, perhaps Levi's very excited. He said, woman, you can't sleep at a time like this. Don't you hear that sound? Where's my sword? I know I put it in this drawer last night, and you're always changing things around. And, and she might say, wait a minute, wait a minute, listen. And she listens for a minute. Levi, I always knew you had a tin ear for music. That's not the sound prepared to fight. That's the sound prepared to worship. There's a special chapel service. Here, take your Bible and get out and leave us alone. Well, you would have to listen in order to understand what the message is all about. And perhaps a few weeks later, the same thing might have taken place. And this time, Levi hears it, and he turns over. He said, well, it takes Moses and Aaron a long time to 
you know, to set up all the chairs for the chapel. And so I probably have another 15 or 20 minutes before I have to, uh, to be present there before roll is taken, you know. And uh, so uh, his wife wakes up and she says, Levi, what are you doing laying there? And he said, that's all right. Uh, I'll get up in time. Levi, that's not the sound. Prepare to worship. That's the sound. Prepare to fight. Here's your sword. And so you had to listen. You didn't know whether to bring the sword or the Bible out with you from your tent. Now, we're told that the rapture will take place when the trumpet sounds, but we're not told what sound will come forth from the trumpet. Now, I believe that God can do anything, of course, and I believe that he can make both sounds come out of the same trumpet. I think both sounds will be forthcoming. And I think that the angels that accompany the Lord Jesus will hear the sound, prepare for battle, prepare to fight. To fight what? Well, you know, we teach our children to sing He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the little bitty bird in his hand. He's got you and me, brother, in his hand. And I believe all this. According to 1 John chapter 5, I believe in the sovereignty of God, but 1 John 5 says, The whole world lieth in the hands of the evil one, and uh, an usurter has taken over the kingdom of God, at least during this dispensation, God has allowed him to do this, and his name is Satan, and he is the king of death, and he is, according to the Bible, the God of this world. The Bible says that the very atmosphere that we live and breathe is filled with his wicked power and presence. He's the king of death, and apparently this means that he has dominion over the dead bodies of departed believers. For example, D.O. Moody died, the great evangelist, in 1899. And Moody's been with Jesus for some 77 years now, and uh, having sweet fellowship with the angels in heaven. But Moody's body has been subjected to corruption in the ground for 76 years. Not only does the devil apparently have some kind of power over the bodies of departed believers. He also, according to the New Testament account, can afflict the bodies of living believers. We know this from several New Testament passages. Now, he cannot uh, possess a believer, but he can certainly oppress a believer and afflict a believer. Well, at any rate, what I'm trying to say is that at the rapture, the dead bodies shall be raised first and then living bodies shall be translated and all be caught up to me the Lord in the air. And wouldn't you know it, Satan will frown on this invasion of his domain. And he's going to put up a fuss about it. And I think the message to the angels will be prepare to fight. But certainly the message to the believers will be prepare to worship. And here's one final thrilling truth about this part of the rapture. In Numbers chapter 10, we're told that in verse 4, it says the concerning the trumpet blowers, if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes which are the heads of the thousands of Israel shall gather themselves unto thee. So if the sound was one trumpet of a certain kind of a sound, only one time, that means that just the biggies, as it were, the the chiefs, the the heads of the uh, princes and everything of the tribes were to attend this special service. And uh, at the rapture, only one trumpet is sounded. And this might suggest that in God's sight, all believers occupy a place of utmost importance. In other words, we are all head princes in the mind of God. Don't you ever belittle yourself and say, oh, I'm absolutely nothing. Well, it's true, you're nothing. But God thought you were everything. And because of what his, the worth he placed on your head, he sent his son to die for your sin. All right, we've looked at a number of items concerning the rapture, the meaning of the word, the participants, the false views. We've looked at the purpose, the mystery, the trumpet, and then the Old Testament foreshadowing of the rapture. There are at least two 
individuals in the Old Testament that definitely foreshadow, pre-type, as it were, the rapture. One is Enoch and the other is Lot. You remember Enoch was taken from this world before the flood judgment. Scripture says that Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And then Lot, who was removed from Sodom before the fire judgment. And so before the great universal judgment takes place, the believer will also be removed as Enoch and Lot were removed before their judgments. And the challenge of the rapture. We'll just go through this briefly and comment fully during the next lecture. There's so much to talk about here. But because of this glorious event, the rapture, the child of God is instructed to do many things. Number one, he is to attend the services of the Lord regularly. Tell me, dear friend, why do you go to church? Well, I go to church because I like the pastor. Or some might say, I go to church because I am the pastor. Others, well, I go to church because it's the in thing to do today. Or I go to church because I feel real obligation to go there. I'm a member, I'm an officer, and if I didn't go, people would wonder why I didn't go. Well, there may be some merit to some of these reasons mentioned. But do you know one of the basic reasons you ought to go to the church, and you ought to be present every time the door of the house of God is open. You ought to because of the rapture. Notice what the book of Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 says about the rapture and about attending church. Uh, the author of this book says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye See the day approaching. What day? You guessed it, the day of the rapture. So, number one, the challenge of the rapture, he is to attend, the believer, the services of the Lord regularly. Secondly, he is to observe the Lord's Supper with the rapture in mind. You know, I was saved nearly 30 years ago. There are two ordinances of the church, we believe. One is the ordinance of baptism. The other is the ordinance of, of uh, communion. When I was saved some 30 years ago, I was baptized by immersion. I've never been baptized again, had no desire to be. Since that time, I have partaken in the other ordinance, which is the Lord's table, many, many times. Why do we celebrate only uh, the first ordinance only one time and the second ordinance many times? Well, because of what they stand for. What does baptism stand for? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, Romans 6. That only happened one time. So we'll only partake of that ordinance one time. Well, wait a minute, Dean Wilmington. Doesn't the Lord's Supper uh, symbolize the uh, death, suffering of Christ? Yes, but more than that. Because in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 26, Paul says, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death. But then he adds these three significant words, Till he come. The next time. You partake of communion, and the organist perhaps playing Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross or the Old Rugged Cross, and you bow your head as the pastor asks you to contemplate on the meaning of the rapture. You think about the historical fact of Calvary. That's fine, and you thank God for what he did, but you also look forward and think about the rapture. For the Lord's table is to remind us not only of Calvary, but also of the rapture, not just of the cross, but of the crown. And so the challenge of the rapture, the believer, is to observe the Lord's Supper. We'll stop with this point at this point and we'll continue during the next lecture.